This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I should say that although it says up there on that initial screen, Institute of English Studies, this is an event um, which has been sponsored generously by the Friends of the University, by the Senate House uh, Library Friends. Uh, by the library itself and, um, and ultimately also by the Institute. Um, it is a symposium on the Carroll Manuscript. I am Warwick Gould, Director of the Institute, and my job is to get myself out of the way and let those who know something about the subject talk. I am not a Shakespearean. Um, but I just wanted to say something about each of the speakers um, and also to give you some idea of what the running order will be um, and to indicate that we will take questions at the end of the whole session, if that's um, in order. Um, every one of these speakers has something to add to the subject from a specialist point of view. And they're going to be adding to the present state of debate and doubt about the whole issue. The doubt goes back to the first publication of an article by Allardyce Nicholl in 1932 uh, about the manuscript and its presence in the library. And I'm going to let James Shapiro, who's sitting, sitting next to me, trace something of the history of that doubt um, before we pass on. We'll come back to him at the end. Uh, but we're going to pass on, in the first instance, to Peter Bauer, who's sitting over there um, at the end, the distinguished paper analyst and paper historian who's going to say something about the paper uh, upon which the manuscript is written. Next to him is Nicholas Eastor from Art Access and Research, who's going to report on recent uh, investigations, conducted indeed as recently as last Thursday, into the ink um, of the manuscript. Sitting next to him is Karen Attar from the University Library, who has recently published the Cowell Manuscript in Shakespeare's survey, and then we'll come all the way back to James Shapiro to say something about the vocabulary uh, in which the manuscript is written. Altogether, we're trying to build up something of a profile of the person who wrote this manuscript, um, and as I say, we know that much of that is yet to come, uh, but the event is being uh, recorded for a podcast, and as, as Jim said to me on the way down, um, people will look back at this at some stage and look at these primitive figures um, sitting there using their primitive methods. I should say that Jim's own methods um, are far from primitive. He is the leading uh, Shakespeare scholar and microbiographer, author of 1599, and of course, author of the 2010 study, Contested Will in which he brought his own reading of the manuscript um, to bear on his opening pages, feeling that this was something that uh, in many ways encapsulated um, the whole nature of the Shakespeare authorship debate. So I'm going to ask Peter Bauer to start, and in order to watch what he has to... Uh, Jim. I'm sorry, ask Jim to start, but when, in order to watch what Peter Bauer is going to put on the screen, I'm going to move over here. Thank you. Actually, I told Warwick in 800 years when they finally solve the mystery of the Powell document, they'll look back at our funny clothing and haircuts and wonder what we were doing in 2013. So uh, thank you for coming today on such a beautiful day. For me, this is exciting. I've been lecturing and teaching for 30 years, and I have never been on a panel that draws upon the expertise of people from so many different disciplines, uh, experts in library science, in history, and ink, and paper. So I'm here to learn as much as you are. And I've had a chance to say my piece both in the TLS and, of course, in the book to which Warwick referred. For those who may not be completely up to speed on this, I'm going to give you a four-minute pod history of the problem of authenticating this document uh, and the Cowell lectures, two lectures that are 
in the Sun House collection were first brought to public attention in late September 1932 by Alarice Nicole, and uh, I'm sorry, in February 25th uh, in the TLS of 1632. First skepticism appeared one week later by a letter writer to the TLS who pointed out, not even having examined the uh, documents themselves, but based on Alarice Nicole's report, that there were discrepancies, historical discrepancies, between what should be in this manuscript and what, in fact, is the case. So that when Cowell describes visiting uh, Stratford-upon-Avon and his interlocutor there, he spoke of visiting him at Barton on the Heath, six miles north of Stratford. And anybody who knows the terrain there knows that it is, in fact, 60 miles due south of Stratford. So from the get-go, there was skepticism about this. And I'm sure, frankly, that Alrice Nicole who could not find out who Mr. Cowell was, who could not find the Ipswich Historical Society where this was uh, first delivered, these lectures first delivered. He lived with his doubts and uh, spoke uh, with conviction about the authenticity of this. We don't know who else might, in the ensuing decades, have expressed doubts because that was not published. The next published account of anyone researching this question appeared in a uh, magazine called Shakespeare Matters, which is effectively a newsletter for people who believe the Earl of Oxford wrote Shakespeare rather than uh, Shakespeare of Stratford. And it appeared in 19, I'm sorry, 2003. And it was a report by a man named Nathan Baca and Nathan Baca described a presentation at a conference of anti stratfordians in which two individuals, uh, one was an independent scholar named John Rollett and the other a, an American professor named uh, Daniel Wright had expressed doubts about the authenticity of this document. And I'm really very sorry that uh, um, John Rollett, uh, Dr. John Rollett, could not be here today because no one has cared more about uncovering the truth of this document than he has. And he lived near Ipswich. He did a tremendous amount of local work to try to uncover any of the historical figures in this. And he came up blank, which increased his suspicions about it. And uh, Daniel Wright was also investigating this. Unfortunately, neither of them ever published or have published since any of their investigations. So it's very hard to know exactly what they discovered other than what appeared in this article. But, and I'll quote from the article, Professor Wright acknowledges that a definitive case, or a definite case rather, for establishing the Cal Report as a forgery has yet to be made. Has yet to be made if it can be made. So I think they must have reached, and again, this is a second-hand report, the feeling that they were just negatives, but there was no evidence. And uh, I turned to this six years later, nothing was published in the interim, and uh, looked at it, met Kenner and called it up, and discovered within a minute or two of looking at this document that there were claims in this document, such as the claim that Shakespeare was a money, letter, money lender in Delton Mall, it could not have been made in 1805 simply because that historical information, the documents that were discovered about Shakespeare's money lending and dealing in mold were not discovered respectively until a few years later for the money lending, 1807, and the 1840s for the mold charge. So it was clear that it was, to me, an anachronism that however clever the forger, and we'll hear more about the forger's techniques, that this was not an authenticated document. And the only thing that has occurred since my own discovery was um, Karen and I were both involved in a, an unsuccessful attempt uh, to make a documentary about the, uh, the BBC didn't pick it up. But the producers were able to bring in Peter to look at the document and make some preliminary findings about that. And that was again in 2010. And I was able to include some of that in my TLS piece as well. That is how matters stand until today. So I'm very curious to turn it over to Peter.
to find out what he knows at this point. Has no, this paper has no watermarks, so you can't have the obvious of it was made by this person at that place. It's the paper leaves a lot of traces. If you look at the here, this is a man forming a sheet of paper. This is transferring that white sheet of paper onto a felt, and this is after the sheets have been pressed. This is somebody sorting through it. Water is an element of paper making and leaves traces in the paper, trace elements and dirt and all sorts. This lovely little illustration here of filtration dates, this is from the 1770s, this illustration, um, shouldn't be trusted. This is theoretical best practice. You filter the water before you use it. <coughs> There's no archaeological evidence anywhere in Western Europe that any mill actually ever did that. So it's, uh, don't trust encyclopedias. Like <laughs> of course, the main part of the paper is what it's made from. And they were made, at this date, they're made from rags. Linen, cotton, to some extent, cotton had just about started to be used in this country. When the cotton industry really got going in this country, basically it didn't start being used in paper making for about 20 years, which is about the time everything, all the old clothes and things were falling apart and got thrown away, so they were used by the paper. The other aspect is hemp. And here we have hemp ropes and bales of sailcloth. If you've got a strong hemp sail that's at sea for 20 years, by the time it's useless, it's been sun bleached, it's been softened, it's weakened, and it's fantastic for making paper. And we were, at this point in 1805, in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars, and there were an awful lot of ships around. The, the Navy was huge, there were lots of merchantmen. There was a mass of um, sailboats. The other uh, thing is, that most of the, a lot of our sailboats and rope came from chattel, and most of the quality paper making in Britain at that point was in, in Kent, on, on various rivers like the Luce and the Medway. You beat this part, you put it in a thing called the Hollander, and by this date, they've begun to realize this fantastic machine that was actually invented in the 1670s in Holland, 
you could develop all sorts of different kinds of paper by how you beat it. And this has a bearing on what kind of paper that is in the manuscript. The pulp that's in the middle of this, it goes round and round and round, and it's crushed here and gravity fed round back to the beginning. The pulp in, by the, the mid feather, the bar in the center, goes round about five times more than the stuff on the outside. So you get long fibers on the outside and much shorter fibers in the so you have a lattice. The photomicrograph here of um, this is linen and hemp, and this is exactly the same microscope slide. This is in normal light, showing that actually a couple of the fibers are blue, they've been dyed blue. Um, but this is in polarized light, which shows you a lot more detail. When I said paper makers could develop all sorts of different characteristics, this is fibrillation. What you're trying to do is break the fiber up, fill it with water, so that when it shrinks, it loses the water, not just around it as it dries, but within the fiber. So it pulls tightly. And the paper used in this manuscript is incredibly strong. And there's a re very good reason for that. The other piece of information you get is the mold that the sheet was made on. This is a mold maker. This is a detail of a watermark on a mold. Now, this is laid paper. These are laid wires, and on top of the support struts are chain wires. And if you hold a sheet of laid paper up to the light, you get what look, a sheet like this. But in the, by the 1790s, it had been invented a bit earlier, but by the 1790s, a different kind of paper was in use called woven paper, which is this, which is made on a woven wire mesh rather than on wires. Now, the paper in the panel manuscript is woven. These are handmade sheets. So every single sheet is actually slightly different. Each time you the the mold, the, the Batman working at the back, dips that mold into the pulp. He takes out some pulp, so the density of the back shifts. So you get different thicknesses. The skill of a good paper maker is to make the same weight with the same internal strength that dries the same way. It's very easy to make one sheet of paper. You make 500 that behave the same. It's a tricky job. It used to be a seven-year apprenticeship. The wet, newly formed sheet is then transferred onto the wet blanket and the whole thing's pressed. At that point, when the coaching takes place, that sheet is still about 90% water, but it's strong enough to hold together. By 1800, the 1790s, 1800, the <coughs> process had become highly industrial. This is taken 100 years after, about 1900, this photograph. But as you can see, there are, there's a back crew here, another one here, another one here, another one there, another one there. They are max producers, but they're doing it by hand. So mills could produce vast amounts of paper. So here we have the title page. <coughs> the staining on this page is from um, a tip in um, newspaper cutting, which is a highly acidic paper that is, is burning into uh, this page. You can see that there are tiny little flecks in some places, and you can see that in another image later on. That is, those are bits of hemp. This paper is a mix of linen. I don't think there's any cotton in there. Linen and hemp. Most of the hemp has probably come from uh, sailcloth, as I said. But some of it was probably not completely clean and bleached. The, the first page had a date on it, 1805. The second part of the book is dated April 1805. Now, it is very unusual to find people writing uh, lectures or uh, a document like this on a paper that wasn't designed for writing. And this paper wasn't 
paper was designed for drawing. It is a what's called a drawing cartridge. And comparisons with papers in my own collection and papers I've seen used by Constable and Ed Leeds and Pye, uh, sorry, and uh, Turner show that it's a type of paper developed by Ed Meads and Pine at Great Ivy Mill near Mason in Kent. Uh, the image is from 1898, but the mill actually wasn't that different 100 years before. Now, there's a very interesting thing. They, Ed Meads and Pine began to make drawing cartridge about 1800, but those early versions are very different to this paper. And there's a lovely quote from Susanna Watman, who was the widow of James Watman, the greatest English paper maker of the 18th century, to her protege, who she brought up, um, who was Watman's successor, William Walston. And this is dated the 10th of February, 1813. I have been in town for two days and procured a bit of paper from Smith and Warner in Piccadilly. It is called cartridge paper and is said to be the discovery of Messrs. Edmeads and Pine, very ingenious men who had laboured hard and tried many experiments before they could succeed in bringing it to its present perfection. The Dutch cartridge is preferred to Mr. Pine's for drawing, but it is not to be had now. But I don't conceive that merely drawing paper could be any object. She didn't want Bolson to make artist paper because there was no money in it. But he did and carried on, and what we were still making fine artist papers in the 20th century. This is dated 1813. Edmonds and Pine broke up, in, well, Pine, uh, Edmonds retired in 1813. Pine continued with Smith and Allnut between 1813 and 1815, and then Smith and Allnut after 1815. This paper is exactly like the Smith and Allnut papers post-1815. Uh, recently, we had a big collection of sketchbooks um, at home which we were examining some of the papers for Smith and Walnut papers, and they're, they're absolutely spot on. Now, there's no watermark in the sheet, and the sheet doesn't fit the normal uh, size of the paper. This is very unclear, but this is a laid mold, and look, this is for two sheets. This is one sheet, one sheet, one sheet, one sheet. There's a watermark, there's a watermark, that's in one sheet of paper. But in wove paper, the watermarks are not in the centre. The watermark is actually there in this sheet, this mold, which just said 18 of them. And it's, I think, quite simply, drawing paper was made much bigger, it's made in um, imperial, 30 inches by 22 inches or uh, double elephant, or very large sizes. I think somebody just cut the watermark there. And, and the name, the Smith and Walnut, you usually put Smith and Walnut on the date along the bottom edge of the sheet. And the reason these pages don't fit any of the standard sizes is because they've been cut. And they're appro it's approximately large post, but it's too big in one dimension too small than the other, and that's precisely what you get when you muck about with the shoot side. Here is a transmitted light detail of the shoot. Now, I mentioned earlier that people beat the fibres quite long. This is the mold, a mould surface, and normally, in a thin sheet of paper, you would be able to see traces of all this, this work of mesh. But here you can't really. There is sort of hints of it, little lighter areas here and there. But the fibre has been left incredibly long. And this is part of a, an artist's paper. Artist's paper, if you're going to draw and paint on paper, it has to be very strong. You want it to be stable. So you, you, you make sure it's got the bulk and the internal strength. Writing papers have to have a good surface strength if you're going to work in a quill or a nib. And I, I think this was written with a metal nib, but uh, it doesn't, certainly doesn't look like a quill. But it's, it's not a fountain pen as such. I don't know what it was. But it is interesting that at this date, the purported date of the document, um, there were actually 
um, metal, metal nibs could be bought. But they've been around forever. So the, the surface of this sheet, if you look at it, is actually, it's supposed to be smooth, but no paper is actually smooth. It, it always has a texture. And if you look at these scanning electron microscopes, details of the surface. You can see that actually there are a great hole, gaping holes in there. There is Brian Donkin's wonderful metal nib. And the image at the bottom of one of the pens. What's nice about it is that you could retract the nib or have it so you have more or less flexibility. <coughs> I don't think further analysis would be needed to work out how this was actually written, how flexible it was, when it was. I would like to, I'm keeping this deliberately quite short, I would like to finish with a comment about Wilmot, who's mentioned in there. I, I have taken to calling him Paul Wilmot because he seems to have been an unassuming cleric who, because of the madness of his niece, Olivia Serres, who wrote his biography and said he was the author of Junius, which he wasn't. Um, all sorts of things get dumped on him now. He's become a sort of figure to go to if you need somebody eccentric in the 18th century to dump stuff on. There's no evidence he ever did any Shakespeare research at all. It just doesn't make sense. And it's interesting that I'm not saying Olivia Serres did this document because I think it's much later than that. But she was, who wrote about Wilmot, she was a serious forger herself. Uh, on the screen is a portrait of Hannah Lightfoot, which is attributed to Joshua Reynolds. Hannah Lightfoot is supposed to have married George III before. This is a copy of one of the marriage certificates that um, Olivia Serres wrote, signed by Wilmot, George, Hannah Lightfoot, William Pitt as a witness. Um, the paper's completely wrong and inappropriate. Uh, she was, after her death, her daughter, also called Olivia, actually took the crown to court in 1866 uh, to claim her inheritance. And the case was thrown out. Basically, the, most of the prosecution case wasn't even uh, presented. Um, I've got a complete transcript of the trial, and it's absolutely fascinating. You read on the web about you know these. The, all, I, mean, I read recently that, that all these documents are locked up in the Royal Library, Windsor. They're not. They're in the public record office, the National Archives. They're queued, and you can get them. Look. There's no mystery. And they are absolutely wrong. She fell into the forger's trap, which is what happened with this book, where you use a totally inappropriate material for what you're doing. The classic one of these from the last, over the last uh, 15, 20 years is the Jack the Ripper diary, which is written in a French photographic album, not a, a ledger or a, a book to write in, and it's all, it had loads of photographs in it, all of which have been taken out, but they've left stains on pages. And they, that takes a lot of years to, 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 to come about. And it's interesting that when they published the, the diary, all the images were kind of manipulated so the stains vanished and the pages look far But in fact, it's a complete 20th minute well, probably about done by 1970. Um, and it's a complete thing. And it's a, like this letter, this, this lecture, it is not uh, right. There is so many things. I haven't gone into all the things which maybe Jane will talk about. Um, you know, the fact that the people mentioned uh, on the title page don't exist. There's no trace of them. Um, the Ipswich Philosophical Society 
wasn't founded until 1818 rather than 1805. It's just rubbish. The more things you put together that are wrong, the wronger it gets. It's very easy to prove things are fake. It's actually much harder to prove things are genuine. Uh, but if one thing is right, that's fine. But if everything you start to look at doesn't add up, then Thank you. Um, excuse me, could I just say, um, before we proceed, that the manuscript itself, of course, is here, and it is open at the page to which people refer, that is to say, the paper that is the page that is stained by the inlay uh, press clipping. Um, so if anyone wants to look at this, and we have brought it down um, from the library today. Um, uh, and now, Thank you. Thanks, Peter. intention of the ink analysis is, is very much along the same kinds of lines as, as Peter's study of the paper. Um, again, I look at all sorts of different materials. Primarily, I, I work on paintings, fine art. Um, but from time to time, we also get to look at um, works on paper. So it could be watercolours, drawings, things like that. So ink comes into the sorts of, uh, of things we look at. But we're very often being asked these kinds of questions about um, you know, when was this produced? How can we tell objectively from the material structure when something comes from? And clearly, in a case like this, you're not just interested in the paper, uh, although Peter's uh, presented some very convincing evidence on, on the, the dating or post-dating of the, the paper in this case. Very often we're faced with something that you might have a, a material white paper that could be credible, but you want to know when the actual writing, drawing, painting, whatever, was applied to the surface. And um, we've, I suppose, evolved over the years ways of tackling these kinds of questions. And it's very much about how appropriate are the materials. We don't really have effective techniques like the familiar rate card of dating where you can just go in and you get a direct date out of it. We have to use what, are, what we call indirect approaches. So you're looking for things that are uh, potentially anachronistic uh, or perhaps are not appropriate for the particular place where something was created. So what we're trying to do is to look at the composition to see have we got materials that would be appropriate for a particular place and time. Therefore, in this case, we're looking very much at the inks. And we need to know not only what the ink is composed of, so do some analysis to work out what it is, but we also need to know that contextual information about um, uh, when different types of inks were available. As we shall see, uh, there's a certain kind of core uh, historical ink that we come across almost universally, uh, the iron galotenate, iron gall inks. Um, and I don't think I'm going to be um, bringing up information that, that's really going to spoil the punchline, as it were, that we're very much in the territory of iron gold inks with this manuscript. However, we need to also be aware of these, <coughs> these other kinds of, uh, of information about special knowledge, that um, it's difficult to essentially uninvent something once it has been created. And therefore, there are always going to be people who have knowledge of past materials. Perhaps it's trying to choose an appropriate paper to create a document of the early 19th century. It might also be an appropriate ink that would be convincing of the period. What we're really interested in are these kinds of fine details, the sorts of things that make it difficult for forgers, people who know a fair amount about it, but perhaps not in the kinds of depth that Peter or myself uh, uh, understand the material structure. So, what did we do? Uh, we brought some high-tech instruments to the uh, to the table. Um, 
we use two techniques. One, one of them is, is this, it's something called X-ray fluorescence. Um, and this particular device tells us what the elemental composition of things is. Uh, in essence, you, you point it at the manuscript and you get a reading out of it. We'll look at some spectra in a moment. Um, but that will essentially tell you uh, what kinds of elements are present in the paper, in the ink, from which we can then infer various things. So we take the manuscript. So we take our manuscript, we mount it up in front of the instrument that I've just shown you, and uh, you can see through a camera, it will show where you're analyzing, so you can point it. There's a little handy light that, that shows up a laser in the system, uh, so that we can align it with some, some feature of interest. And we might look at areas of ink, we might look at areas of paper as well, just to see what the different composition is. And we then get a spectrum out of it, which is what's going to tell us what the elemental composition is. And here's a set of um, elemental spectra. Since I'm going to show a couple of graphs, um, I'd better explain, in essence, what they're telling you. Uh, these kinds of things, they're telling you uh, there's an energy value along here which corresponds to different elements, and there's an intensity up here which basically indicates sort of how much of whatever it is there is. Uh, you have handy things like a periodic table of the elements that you can highlight particular elements that you're interested in, and so you can get uh, a readout of essentially what different elements are present in your sample. Here's a couple of examples of, in more detail, of the uh, sorts of results we get. So we can see that we're picking up a whole range of elements um, in both ink and paper. Uh, some of these are fairly classic, uh, and one or two I think are of, of particular interest. We seem to have a fair amount of uh, lead. Uh, we're getting things like copper and zinc. Uh, we're getting lots of iron. We're getting tiny bits of other things like chromium and magnesium. Uh, the calcium, a lot of these things in the paper, Peter was talking about uh, filtering the water. This is the kind of thing that gets into the paper uh, just as part of the, the creation process. Um, I'll give a couple of explanations of some of these elements. <coughs> There's one other thing that I want to draw your attention to is there's a certain amount of silver. And it's silver that we find in the ink, but not in the, the paper. So it's something that we can say, because it's present in one, not the other, that it's actually within the ink rather than the paper. So we've got a mixture here of some things that appear in both, and one or two things that appear just in the ink. Now, um, we have to be slightly careful in that um, some of the paper can come through the, the ink, so it's not, it's as if you're mixing them up to some extent. But it's giving us an idea of what sorts of things might be present. Now, with these iron gall inks, as the name implies, we are expecting to find iron. The slight problem is here that we have a lot of iron in the paper. We also seem to have it in the ink. Uh, nonetheless, it's consistent with it being a non-gold ink. Okay, these aren't gold inks, what are they? Um, I pulled out a couple of historical recipes from around the kind of time if this manuscript had been written in the early 19th century. Um, some of them I think I chose partly because the titles of the books are so great. Um, uh, but in essence, there was a lot of kind of knowledge about what sorts of things you needed to make inks. And a lot of these recipes were published, and it's very easy to go out and, and search you know, the internet or whatever to find what people were putting into these things. And we can see here uh, the kinds of recipes that people were providing. So we've got things, galls, green vitriol, logwood, gum, blue vitriol, and sugar candy. <laughs> it's not so you can make it and, you know, sweet ink. Uh, but these are some examples of what uh, an iron gall ink would look like if you made it up. Here's another one. Uh, yes, the young man's best companion and guide to useful knowledge. Um, but again, if you read through this in detail, they talk about gall nuts, and there's a logwood, uh, gum arabic, uh, green vitriol. Uh, so again, similar sorts of, of, of components. <coughs> 
in essence, um, what you typically find, there are like three main things you typically find in these recipes, gallnuts, uh, essentially like oak galls that you, you can go out to the, to the parks or the forests and you can find today, uh, what they call green vitriol, which we call arm 2 sulfate and gum arabic. Basically, uh, the uh, gamotannins in the gallnuts will react with the uh, iron sulfate to form the basic ink and you have some gum arabic in there to make it sort of a handleable liquid. But you also find some of these other things, uh, like you sometimes find these additions of blue vitriol, which is copper sulfate. And very often they also mention a dye, basically because when you first make the ink up and write with it, it's quite pale, and it takes time to actually turn to the kind of color that you see on the manuscript. So it was quite typical to put a dye in, essentially so you could see what you were writing. But it's useful for us in that these are all components that we can try and uh, analyze for and identify. So what are we going to expect? We're going to expect things like the iron from the green vitriol to show up. We might expect copper if there's uh, a, a blue vitriol used in the recipe to show up in our elemental analysis. And you can go back and you can look at lots of these recipes and the different kinds of proportions of things and learn something about them from your analysis. Do you have copper in the ink? Is that an indicator that you've got uh, blue vitriol as part of the recipe? Does it belong to this kind of category of recipe or that category of recipe? And again, uh, we'll come back to the dye component uh, because that's also of, of particular interest to do with how we date things. Okay, so what did we find? Um, we certainly found iron, which we would say is to be associated with green vitriol in the recipes, so the iron galotanic inks. The copper, we could say it was the blue vitriol, copper sulfate, but I don't think so in this case. It's far more likely, because it comes along with zinc, to be brass, and therefore it's likely to be rollers or something like that used in the manufacture of the paper. What we don't have is why we got silver there. None of these recipes actually show uh, silver being mixed in. There's another possible explanation, one which you've already been shown. Um, and I thank Peter for drawing my attention to this. These kinds of nibs, particularly, um, is a particular interest in this patent that they're talking about steel, brass, silver, gold, or platina. So silver nibs are quite clearly uh, something that is to be uh, anticipated, some, that somebody would use a silver nibbed pen to write this manuscript. And so we could suggest at the very least that the silver is coming into this uh, analysis because somebody was using a silver nibbed pen to write it with. Okay, what else can we do? We can try and look for the other features of the ink. Um, and as I say, we can go and look at recipes, hist different historical recipes to try and work out whether it perhaps derives from one particular set of recipes rather than another. These things are relatively simple in their formulation, so we don't get as much variation perhaps as we might find when we're looking at pigments in paintings, for example. Um, so there's a limited amount that we can currently tell about that kind of thing. We can also look for these other things like the copper sulfate, uh, which might help us to categorize recipes more. But that brings us actually to uh, this other component that gets commonly mixed in, which is the dye stuffs. And the dye stuffs are subject to more variation. So although iron gallotanate inks have been used for centuries until really uh, a lot of the 20th century developments with uh, the um, all point pens, fibre tip pens, such like, those kinds of inks. Basically, the composition of these kinds of things hasn't changed that much. But what has changed is the availability of a variety of dye stuffs. And the logwood that I mentioned, one of the properties of logwood, it's, it would be good for that initial coloration, but actually it wasn't a terribly good dye stuff in its own right. So uh, it faded very badly, which perhaps wouldn't matter too much. But if you had better, more intense, dye stuffs, you would probably tend to use them in the ink. So that would be a natural thing to look for because 
the better dye stuffs, particularly synthetic dye stuffs, start coming in from uh, the second half of the 19th century. So people start to use uh, a different <coughs> kind of dye <diet coughs> so This is something that we can actively look for. So how do we do this? Another bit of kit, another day, another bit of kit. This is what we were doing um, as recently as last Thursday. Uh, this is something called Raman microscopy, or it's Raman spectroscopy, and we use it as a microscope technique. And this is a Raman microscope. It's actually the one we have in our laboratory. Uh, if you open the thing up, inside there's a microscope, and you can put the uh, object underneath the microscope, and you can focus the Raman down. It's a very precise technique. You can look at extremely small uh, sizes, amounts of material, very sophisticated, and uh, can give you um, lots of useful data. We use our Raman microscope all the time for looking at uh, things like dye stuffs, really. However, in this case, we have some slight problems. You can't fit the Cal manuscript into one of these devices. So we can't easily tuck the, the pages of the manuscript um, uh, under the microscope to take <coughs> measurements. Um, we won't allow it either to cut little bits out of the manuscript. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to use something else, <laughs> which is this thing, which is actually uh, an extra probe that goes onto the Raman microscope, which is on the end of a very long fiber optic cable. And it means that you can position this uh, particular head onto the, onto the manuscript where you want it. There's a bit of a problem with this, which is essentially that um, if the microscope part is the ideal way to do your measurement, by the time you've run your signals down uh, 10 meters of fiber optic cable, you don't get such good results. And so you're straining very much at the, the, um, uh, the kind of limits of what you can get uh, with uh, this technique. Anyhow, here's some, here's some uh, more spectra. Um, in this case, again, we're getting intensity uh, on the y-axis, axis, uh, and this is um, basically wavelength. So each of these peaks corresponds to something Rather than the elemental composition, we're looking at things like molecular composition, how the molecule is formed. And these are very complementary kinds of analysis for us. If we've got elemental information and we've got something that's structural about molecules we're dealing with, we can actually tell quite a lot about what, what we've got. So if we know that the ink contains iron and it's got spectra like this, that we're dealing with iron galactanatics. This is actually um, three uh, spectra from a, a very good paper on analysis of uh, historical galactanate inks, um, showing basically uh, a sample from a historical object and basically two uh, synthesized samples to show that you can make these inks and they look like uh, what you would find on the manuscript. Um, even under the best of circumstances, and this work was, uh, in this paper was actually done using a microscope system on one of these probe devices, but you find you get quite a lot of variation. And uh, in some cases, you might find you're not getting very much information at all, and in other cases, maybe this one down here, you get lots of these peaks, which help you to identify very precisely what you're, what you're dealing with. So we've got two problems there. I think I'm making excuses in advance here, but basically, you've got two problems. You've got difficulties with the instrumentation that we can use for the Cal manuscript. We've got problems with inherent variation in the inks themselves. So, what did we get out of our, our work last Thursday? This is what we got, nothing. <laughs> we didn't get any useful spectra out of it. Um, which doesn't mean that ultimately one can't. Uh, it simply means that the particular combination that we were using was frustratingly <coughs> uninformative. Uh, that none of the spectra were showing the kinds of peaks. We were suffering from uh, issues to do with weak signals. Um, it's a technique that suffers from fluorescence problems. Uh, difficult to see the peaks that you want to see. So essentially, we were not able to get uh, a conclusion about whether we had iron galotanate inks on the basis of the Raman spectra, still think it is from the, the elemental results, 
but we couldn't even explore these questions of whether you might have a dye stuff present that we could detect. For the future, it may well be possible with, uh, if we can take a sample, <laughs> uh, but with different uh, instrumentation, I think there are uh, um, possibilities for exploring those kinds of aspects. Or it was simply um, a, a type of iron gold ink that doesn't give very good spectra and it doesn't have uh, dye stuffs in it that we can easily pick up. So, uh, where next? Um, well, I think in conclusion, really, we, we do have the indication that it's one of these iron gold type inks. Um, in terms of dating this, it's not adding very much to the, to the mix. Um, these are things that could have been used throughout the period, either by somebody uh, appropriately or by somebody with the kind of knowledge of what to use that would be convincingly uh, of the period. We can suggest also that there may have been this silver nib pen used. Um, there may still be a recipe out there that somebody's used silver nitrate in it or something like that. Who knows? Um, but the silver nib pen thesis seems to be the most likely. We couldn't detect any other uh, uh, useful dating components. We found um, no clearly anachronistic elements. Uh, we couldn't detect any uh, dye stuffs that might indicate possible use of modern synthetics. Um, and, but nonetheless, it still leaves uh, further analysis open for the future. Although uh, perhaps we haven't come to strong conclusions on the ink analysis at this stage, there are still potentially other things that might be done with different equipment, different approaches in the future. Thank you. Right, I'm coming at this question as a book and library historian. I first came to Darling Lawrence through having catalogued his library and then through writing an article for the journal The Library on Durning Lawrence and his books. And my contribution isn't, isn't about the manuscript as such, it's about the place of the manuscript within his library. Incidentally, before I go further, I'm aware that my voice is quite high pitched. Can you all hear me? All right. Good, that's fine. The like. The manuscript came with what was described as the library of Sir Edwin Durning Lawrence, who was an extremely prominent Baconian, born 1837, died 1914. An absolutely ordinary man uh, who went to Stratford even in 1885 and took home a piece of the famous mulberry from Shakespeare's birthplace. He didn't take it off the tree, it had gone to the ground through the wind. But in 1888, he was converted to the Baconian theory through having read Ignatius Donnelly's The Great Cryptogram. And upon being converted, he set out to collect what he himself described as a Baconian library. He's a prominent Baconian because he wrote about his Baconian beliefs, most notably in a monograph, uh, Bacon is Shakespeare, published in 1910, also in smaller works, also in letters to the press. He lectured prolifically <coughs> on the Baconian theory. In fact, he was giving a lecture a week before he died. And the reason he's so prominent is that he was exceedingly wealthy and he could afford to promulgate his writings. So he boasted that he had sent a copy of his book, Bacon and Shakespeare, to every public library in the world. Public means just any non-private library, so any academic library as well. This is perfectly conceivable. We have got volumes of his invoices, uh, three enormous scrapbooks, and these 
start mainly with purchasers of works definitely by Francis Bacon. They then go on to purchasers of other books. And in the third volume, a very great many invoices are concerned with publication and distribution of his book. So he was known as a Baconian. As regards his library, uh, it was very, it's very, very well documented. It's unusual, I think, to have a library which is as well documented as he is. It came to Senate House and we know about it through the books, but we also know about it because it came with three volumes of accessions registers. It came with his own manuscript catalogue. It came with these three massive volumes of invoices. And it came with two inventories made for insurance purposes. One after he died in 1914, and one after his widow, who the library to the University of London, died in 1929. In addition to knowing about his library, we know quite a lot about him and, or not him so much, but his writings, including the mostly not very flattering reactions to his monograph through large volumes of press clippings. And from these we can establish certain things. The main thing I would say is I don't think Durning Lawrence himself ever saw this manuscript. There are various reasons why I think this. The first is that it is not in the existing register and the second is that it is not in his manuscript catalogue. It's quite easy to see because there's a section in the manuscript catalogue just headed manuscripts with a whole list of the manuscripts that he owned and it is not there. This catalogue was not maintained after he died in 1914, uh, although the library remained in its quarters from 1914 until 1929. There's something else odd about it, which is that he didn't say anything at all about it. And I am quite sure that if he had had it, he would have done. This is because he wrote so prolifically that he didn't, in a way, write confidently. He wrote very forcefully. Most chapters of his book, Bacon is Shakespeare, end with the word, Bacon is Shakespeare, <laughs> at each chapter, as in, such and such goes to prove that Bacon is Shakespeare. Someone said, this is just like um, an advertisement that you read as you're going along in a, a train on a railway cutting or something. But the last chapter of that book seems to say, well, actually, I think Bacon is Shakespeare because all these famous people think that Bacon is Shakespeare. Henry James thought so. Mark Twain thought so. As if he needed his opinion bolstered. Now, a clergyman would be an extremely good person to bolster his opinion, simply because clergymen were held in high repute because of their profession. And also, something about the age of the claim would have been a good thing to quote as well. He didn't write about it at all. And a couple of weeks ago, looking through the archives, to, think, to wonder whether there was anything I could say about the manuscript that I hadn't already said, I came across two copies in two different scrapbooks of an article um, which presents 
uh, by Mr. R. W. Bowers, who presents the history of the Baconian theory. The letter was written to the South London Press on the 17th of June 1910. So let me tell you what appears to be the genesis of the Baconian heresy. In 1848, an American author, Mr. J.C. Hart, in his book, The Romance of Yachting, is said to have thrown doubt on Shakespeare as the author of those immortal plays. In 1856, Mr. William Henry Smith issued a pamphlet, modestly printed for private circulation, in which he sought, by hints and innuendos, as Sir Edwin has done, without abusing a single contemporary witness, to lead the British public into the belief that Bacon, and not Shakespeare, wrote the plays. Now this reference to the romance of Yachting in 1848 is to the book that was thought as a standard thing to have been the first reference to the Baconian theory. And a letter that actually mentioned this book provided Sir Edwin Derby Lawrence with the most wonderful opportunity to, to jump in with yet another of his many letters to the South London Press and say, no, actually it isn't. And here's the evidence of it. The, there's another fairly unusual thing, though I don't think it can be treated as absolutely conclusive, and that is the books of invoices. There is no invoice for this item. Now that's not conclusive, because on occasion I have gone all through these three weighty volumes, looking for invoices for specific works for one reason or another. And there are other items which we know he had, and for which I can't find an invoice. Perhaps some things did just miss filing. But it's a little odd. It doesn't have his standard library markings either. It has our standard markings, which show that it entered the library in 1931 and everything else. But not his. Although there is no invoice, there is this odd piece of paper which you mentioned in his book, Contested Will. And I think, did you also mention it in the TLS article? I might have. Yeah. Which just says, the Cowell manuscript, eight pounds, eight shillings, Lady Dan and Lawrence holds the receipts. And that Lady Durning Lawrence acquired this is very, very conceivable. In fact, if she hadn't, how would it have got to the University of London? What do we know about Lady Durning Lawrence? We know that they married in 1874, that they were very happy, that they had very few differences of opinion. We know that one of the ways in which she concurred with her husband was that she herself was a Baconian and she was a member of the Ladies Guild of St Albans or whatever it was called, the Female Baconian Society. And interestingly, we have at Senate House not just the Durning Lawrence Library but also the Bacon Society Library and in one of their books there's a letter from Lady Durning Lawrence. It's just asking something quite basic about the number of members or subscriptions or the rules, whether they have a copy of the rules of the society or something like that. We also know for sure that she did acquire certain books. The manuscript, as regards its content, i.e. being about the Bacon Shakespeare authorship controversy, fits very nicely into the Durning Lawrence Library. It fits nicely into it in that it certainly was not the only manuscript. It fits very nicely into it in that he had 329 items listed as being about the controversy. And from the beginning of his recorded buying, he was buying items concerning the controversy. We know that Lady Durning Lawrence acquired 
Well, we know that he was given books sometimes because of inscriptions in them. And we know that he bought because we do have definite invoices. This at eight pounds, eight shillings, was definitely one of the more expensive items that she bought. It was not the most expensive. She purchased a copy of a, a Spanish edition of Don Quixote, first volume 1605, a second one published 16, 16 uh, for 60 pounds from Davis and Oyoli in 1923. And we also know that she bought another manuscript. We don't know for sure which one, but there's a receipt from someone called Hein Dresden, the writing looks like, in Mines and Organs, Hove, Sussex, 21st of September 1925, saying, received from Lady E. Dern and Lawrence the sum of 12 guineas for a manuscript. And that invoice is annotated Bacon's signature. Today I was looking to see what it could possibly be. Most of the manuscripts in the Dern and Lawrence Library are 17th century ones. A lot of them were bought from Philip's sales. But there is an S319, which is letters paid and citing Bacon's authority for issuing um, the instructions. Single pieces of parchment, not like the Powell manuscript, not marked in any way as Durning Lawrence's, and in fact, because they're single pieces of parchment, it's difficult that these ones could have been. As regards her other purchases, they're mostly quite cheap, and they are all Shakespeare, Bacon, sorts of things. We've got titles like the story of Hamlet and Horatio for 12 shillings, the Shakespeare mystery for 5 shillings, Shakespeare mystery again for 5 shillings, Greenwood, Ben Johnson and Shakespeare for 7 shillings, two copies of Citizen's Baconian Essays, two of Willow the Wisp, two of Francis Bacon, Cipher by Nature, three pounds 11 shillings together, very much the sorts of things that her husband was buying. Now, we don't, what we don't have is very much correspondence to do with purchases, just the invoices. But there is an example of an approach to Dernard Lawrence himself from the 20th of September 1910. I thought you might be interested in a book which has just come into my hands. It is a history of Philip de Comines printed in London in 1601. This book is usually regarded as Shakespeare de Caliana. Now this is the kind of letter that a bookseller would write to somebody who he thinks is likely to buy his items. There's no reason why somebody wouldn't have approached Lady Derny Lawrence in the same way. Everybody knew that Derny Lawrence had a Baconian library, or everybody who was interested in knowing would have known that, because he himself wrote letters in the press and he wrote in his book saying things like, I have got a fine Baconian library. And because, in fact, other people said so as well. So even in the Montreal Daily Star in Canada, there was an article from the 7th of January 1911 uh, talking about Sir Edwin Derny Lawrence, the wife of the accompanying noteworthy article, da -da -da -da, um, <coughs> who enjoys the distinction of one of the finest private collections of original editions of 16th and 17th century books of British and continental production extensively, <coughs> more particularly those bearing even remotely and indirectly on the society's field of study. <coughs> And there's another article in the Daily Express from February 1911 saying, No Virginia has perhaps spent <coughs> so much time and money in discovering and disseminating what he believes to be the truth of the matter of Sir Edmund Ernie Lawrence, 
formerly MP for Kuro who has in his house in Carlton House Terrace one of the most valuable libraries bearing on the controversy in the world, a library which has cost him many thousands of pounds. He gave 10,000 pounds for four volumes alone out of many hundreds. So it was known <coughs> that he had a Napoleon library, it was known that he was interested in buying, it was also very well known that he could afford to buy and by implication, it could be thought that his widow could also afford to buy. Um, he was an extremely charitable gentleman, and his charities were known as well. When he died, they were listed in his victory. What also could have been known, although it may not have been, is that he was gullible. His widow wrote in the preface to Alexander Gordon's collective biography, The Lawrences of Cornwall, saying that her husband's library was Baconian and formed entirely uh, with the one aim in mind to prove that Bacon wrote all the works of Shakespeare. My husband was no bibliophile. That's true. She wasn't either. If this item was a forgery, it is not the only forgery in the library, or at any rate, it is certainly not the only item in the library that is not what it seems. He boasted about his copy of the second third year of Shakespeare as being unique because it has the only reading of a particular word in the introductory verse. Well, it's not. What's happened is that that page has been uh, put in. It's on a very recognisable star from a different issue of the second folio. He had a copy of Alice's Adventures in London with a page, with a picture at the beginning, which is thought to have been an original illustration by Tenniel. And it was described as that uh, in both the inventories. Well, it wasn't until a few years ago that someone called Paul Goldman was an expert in Victorian drawings. And no, that's not by Tenniel. It's by one of his pupils. And apparently it's quite common for Tenniel's pupils to copy what he did. There's another example among the manuscripts where we've got a note in our typescript catalogue of the manuscripts that something could well be in both his hand. And there's a note from 1978 saying Peter Beale and Peter Croft, who at that time was the fellow and librarian of King's College in Cambridge, have looked at this. And no, it isn't in Bacon's handwriting. And there's something else which would definitely have been known as a forgery, at least to some at the time, and that's a binding on one of his incunacula. It's a binding with his Rolioesque in style, that's, uh, it looks 16th century and it's a geometric design with the arms of Henry II and Catherine de Medici on it. And it is described in the Daniel Lawrence Library documentation as being by Prolia or a contemporary of Prolia. But it wasn't. As by a man called Monsieur Aguet, who worked in Belgium, who had specialty of obtaining 15th and early 16th century books and of selling them as being in Prolia's findings. He saw most of them through Quaritch. He had Quaritch finally thought it was rather odd that Okay, was able to produce so many of these things, confronted him with it, and Hage actually admitted to the forgery. A man called Blacker in London had bought most of them in the first instance and was informed before he died that actually all these books for which he paid goodness knows how many pounds. <laughs> 
were actually forgeries and after, he, he wouldn't believe it. And after his death, they were sold as 19th century imitations of 17th century French bindings. Well, at the time that Daniel Lawrence acquired it, this forgery was known. But to Learning Lawrence, the binding was original. So, in other words, the Dunning Lawrences were gullible, and they were both an easy touch. I think that's all I have to say. <laughs> I'm going to be very brief and uh, put my hand out so that I can be even briefer. Um, just pass them around. I'll start some this way as well, please. Um, thank you. I'm hoping that one of the things we can arrive at with your contribution uh, as we, I'll speak for five minutes now and then we'll open up to questions so that we can perhaps collectively with your expertise and the expertise of uh, the panel uh, in the symposium, try to get more of a profile of the kind of individual who might have had the knowledge of paper, the knowledge of Bernie Lawrence's, the knowledge of ink, and uh, the knowledge of Shakespeare and the Shakespeare controversy to put in the spectacular amount of intellectual energy required to produce the volume that work is carefully watching right now. Um, when I, when I did this work in 2010, uh, and I came across, I'm just doing a, a basically a, a, a riff on a single sentence, the sentence that I mentioned earlier, and I'm doing from Karen's uh, recently published edition of that manuscript. This is the key sentence for me, the one that reads, it is strange that Shakespeare, whose best years had been spent in a profitable and literary vocation, should return to an obscure village offering no intellectual allurement and take up the very unromantic business of a money lender and dealer in all. That phrase, very unromantic, stuck out in my mind. And like most scholars of a certain age, uh, I did what one does, which is go to the OED and see how early that word appears. And in fact, it was first used in 1733 in a letter by Jonathan Swift. But between 1733 and 1805, the OED had no references to it. And what I'm suggesting now is another way forward in investigating these sorts of documents, which is, you might call it data mining, looking in a more sophisticated way at what is become available in recent years, which is the databases of all texts that survive, that have been printed. This leaves out manuscript texts, so it's not complete. But what I did was typed in into a number of databases, literature online, um, uh, Ebo, uh, 19th century texts, not all of them produce the exact same results, but this is just a representative one to give you a sense of how we may go forward in investigating when a document was written, or alternatively, if we get a better sense of the language that is accumulated by somebody in the course of a lifetime and becomes ingrained in that author, when somebody's training might have led them to use a certain word or phrase. So I have really two graphs here. And this is, I think, the first uh, time I've ever handed out a graph that I've constructed <laughs> because I don't know what I think when it comes to this stuff. But I have to say it was illuminating. Start with the bottom one, the bottom image, the flat line of frequencies of the number of documents where the word unromantic appears. And there's nary a heartbeat between 1700 and that little blip between 1796 and what looks like about 1800. And then this word starts entering into the vocabulary and spikes sometime uh, around the First World War. Uh, 
And if you look at that even more unusual phrase, very romantic in the graph of Bob, you will notice that there are very few documents that refer to them, uh, usually one or two or at most three in any given year. And this spikes around 1900. Now, right now, this is a very <coughs> coarse method of analyzing language. But if one were to subject uh, rare words in a document like this, and this is a fairly long document, you could begin to get a picture of when this document might have been written. We know now that it was written after 1880 simply because the argument in the Cal document steals from Sidney Lee's essay on Love's <coughs> Lover's Laws, published in Gentleman's Magazine in 1880. So that evidence, rather than anticipating it as Allardyce and Nicole imagined, so that evidence points to something after 1880, and obviously by the time Allardyce and Nicole looked at it in the third decade of the 20th century. This is just representative as a way of going forward, even as we saw ways of looking at more ink analysis or paper analysis, as a way not just simply of uh, flogging, what I find is a fascinating document, but working collectively into, in an interdisciplinary way to start answering questions that until quite recently uh, we didn't reach out and discuss with each other. And I think that uh, uh, it's instructive, and none of us individually could have put this together, and collectively we're moving a little bit further along in this investigation. And with luck, somebody, John Rollett, somebody else who's really putting time on this, may well discover who is behind this uh, forgery. Uh, I'd love to open it up to your questions and comments and suggestions, especially those that might help us profile the individual or individuals uh, who might be behind this. And I thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Can we, uh, when you uh, ask a question, can you indicate to whom you wish to ask the question? And do we have someone who would like to start? Yes, please. Um, it's kind of a two-fold question. Um, firstly, for Jim, is there any significance to the date, the purported date that's in the manuscript? Is it 1805, 1804? It's 1805. Why 1805? And ask the second question so that I can... Well, the second question is going to depend on that. It refers to the maybe cutting out the watermark date. Why would you go to the length of forging a document if the date didn't matter? Why wouldn't you just match it to the date of the watermark? If you, in terms of paper, unused sheets of paper do survive. Um, I recently looked at late 15th century North Italian paper that hasn't been used, but it's beautiful. But it's very hard to, if you want to create something, it's very hard to go out and find paper of the right date. It's fairly accidental. Yes, I think the point is, is that it's kind of adventitious that you would create a document to fit the date you have on the paper. Yeah. 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 I mean, see, if you're going to all the bother of using quite possible ink and, you know, constructing such a thing, it seems stupid to cut out a date, to match a date that doesn't matter. It so, does matter, though, because... Oh, sorry, the last please, please. Uh, Because in the first lecture, uh, Carol says, well, I'm going to present some arguments that are absolutely startling, but I can't say who said so because he made me keep it secret. In the 2nd of April, supposedly of April 1805, he says, well, I've just got permission from the man who told me this to say to me, so why did you do it, say it to anybody else because he's really coy about it? and it's this man, James Wilmot. And Wilmot died in 1807. The key is, in other words, Wilmot's death. As, as Peter suggested, a lot of garbage has been dumped on Wilmot's grave. 
and he becomes a kind of catch-all for this kind of work. And what's so brilliant about the forgery, and I, I take pleasure in, in great creative work, however you imagine it, uh, what's so brilliant about it is um, it's built on the work of an earlier forger, uh, Cyrus uh, uh, Romans, uh, uh biographer. And uh, once those two are so fully intertwined, almost impossible to pull apart. So that 1805 date is critical, really, to put it in the right range for Wilmot's biography that Sears largely fabricated. And now they're intersected in that way. I wonder if I could just add, add to that by saying that if you look at the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography online, uh, the first thing it says about James Wilmot is that it had been believed um, that uh, he is, you know, the first Baconian, but that since 2010, since Professor Shapiro's book, um, this is now not his claim to fame. Um, it, uh, if you had looked at the old DNB, uh, prior to the publication of the TLS article, you would have seen that Wilmot was then considered to be the most famous for this theory. I'm sorry to shrink anyone's PMP page. <laughs> <laughs> yes, William, yeah. Um, I, I've got no expertise to offer here, except that I have, have read lots and lots of documents of the of the period round about 1805. I haven't even looked at it, but it's even with the, the, uh, the small piece that was put up, I immediately thought, well, that's not 1805. That's a, a handwriting of a later period. And I don't know whether uh, uh, anyone has uh, done that in any sort of systematic way, but that, that was my immediate impression. It would fit, fit with that. The, the other thing is that and this also comes from my having read a lot of commonplace books of Byron and Shelley and the hundreds and hundreds of those things of the period around about 1805 and the Victorian period that follows. That uh, with the with uh, Shakespeare and Byron and Shelley and a number of others becoming very, very famous and canonized and fetishized. There's a, a, a substantial industry grows up of fakes and forgeries. Um, uh, there's a, a man who can call himself Major Byron, who, who uh, said a book we written about him, who had a, uh, a substantial literature of many years created, uh, fake Byron and fake Byron, you know, mainly by taking existing works and, and just adding a bit here and there. And, so you can, you, they can be detected not, not so much by the technical, scientific approach as by the, the critical approach that people recognize the source from them. And, and it occurred to me that there, uh, there, there are autograph and manuscript dealers. I mean, you, you've gone in from the invoice side, Karen, here. But the, the British Library and others have um, very good runs of catalogs of autograph dealers and dealers and those who once called Waller, I remember, who, who sell a mixture of, of, of genuine documents and doubtful documents and things like that. And you might, if you had a precise date, you might be able to pick up the other side of that. It wouldn't take it to the, to the author, but it would um, help to date it, I suspect. I want to ask my expert panelists whether they have ideas about ink, but I want to add one thing in, in relationship to the other part of your comment. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a really pregnant idea because we might try looking at other places, other libraries or collectors who might have been offered this yes, manuscript the yes. and might have turned it down. Yes. So, but that, there might be records of that as well investigating the folders of the obvious uh, case. Um, one thing that's really important in this is uh, in the story is that uh, experts, academic experts like our Allardyce and Colin, Sam Schoenbaum, both of whom I revere, um, 
did not exercise enough skepticism and for all we might make fun of or uh, denigrate anti-Stratfordians, uh, one great service they do is they keep asking hard and skeptical questions. And if not for that skepticism, uh, this question would not have uh, opened up in the way that it has. And I think as scholars we have to be uh, a little bit more uh, willing to um, examine our own assumptions and one of the values of the interdisciplinary work that we're trying to do here is that uh, when you work against other disciplines, you begin to ask questions you don't ordinarily ask within your own. And that's one of the things that I've been uh, really enjoying about this. You two look at signatures. This is other ways of judging the handwriting here in any way that might reflect a dating? Well, uh, I would definitely not go to a graphologist. Yeah. Uh, no one. Um, uh, but there are uh, forensic uh, right, handwriting uh, examiners like Bob Bradley who uh, it might be worth showing. Did anything jump off the page for either of you just looking at well, the Well, the one thing that struck me, and I didn't talk about it at all, is that I'm always, um, particularly with gelatin size uh, cellulose, uh, they can burn the paint. Yeah. And you would expect probably to see ink well of some de to some degree. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There I, isn't really, to my mind, I just think there isn't enough. Yeah, I, I, it's, 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 there are whole areas that, that I didn't really touch on, um, but there are ways of looking at things like what happens to the eye and the ink because it does react to the cell at the same time. Great. A lot of uh, unbought ink research over the past decade or two has been very much focused on kind of conservation aspects to do with. Uh, degradation, how you treat that. Uh, but you can also look at it in terms of this is a process that takes place over time. So although I said there's no ticking clock in this, in fact there are mechanisms going on which might potentially allow you to look for uh, those changes. It's complicated, uh, people have tried it, made all sorts of claims, it's the sort of thing that needs serious scientific academic re-examination, but there is the potential there for those kinds of approaches. And I think I'd uh, quite like to add here is that we are, from our perspective in the interdisciplinary, it's because we're providing very complementary kinds of, uh, of examination that although, yes, you can apply these, these uh, uh, sort of traditional colossarial uh, approaches, it's being challenged by these radically different uh, approaches that, that bring these kinds of debates to the fore, and very important. Mm -hmm. Yes, Simon. Can I ask Karen something? You mentioned that uh, the manuscript cost <coughs> a guineas. It strikes me as a very small sum, particularly if we're talking about post-First World War, not a period of considerable inflation. It's really pretty and the other thing I have is, um, have you tried the Engram system on Google, which is uh, to do with less of the distribution, because that I thought was mm -hmm. something rather interesting to us too. That's a great suggestion. Yes. Um, about the cost, I wonder whether the person would just have thought it was what he could legitimately ask for it. It would have been old rather than antiquarian, bearing in mind that the obviously the manuscripts they would have revered in the collection would have been the 17th century ones and earlier. 15th century. 
manuscript Bible there. And I doubt that either one in Lawrence or his widow would have known very much about the value of anything in that they just They were out to prove, or he was definitely out to prove a point, and wouldn't have had much concept of what you would expect to pay for a manuscript. I'm just wondering if, the, if it were a forger to a selling document, that's a pretty poor return. Why is this quite a long method? But if he had pitched the price too high, imagine having done all this work and asked for too much so that Mrs. Durning Lawrence said, you know, it's more than I'm willing to pay. So I think it's a very low number as well. But I think it's a low number because his interest was not financial, but his interest was in implanting this virus, if you will, into this collection. There could be a dealer. Yes, yes. I'm just wondering, is it a forger? Or is it yeah. an intermediary who's yes. beginning to doubt? Well, do the yes. deal yes. go, if you are this person, if we're creating a profile, do you go through a dealer? Or do you approach the during loans as yourself? That seems to me a pretty significant question that needs to be answered. Yes, there's a question over here. A question over here. Um, I mean, why do we necessarily think it was the forger who did the seller? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the person who sold it could have completely believed in the manuscript. And um, that's sort of one question. I mean, the planting idea, I mean, we're sort of near the right plaque kind of idea. <laughs> you know, of let's just plant something. But usually forgers try a little harder than that. And they also, uh, yeah, I think would say are in it for a little bit more money. I mean, I my um, I spent 15 years co-authoring a book on Tom Payne Collier, mm -hmm. and I right, there you know go. how forgers work. Right. Okay. Are there any professional forgers in the room? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a professional forger, but I ha I have met at least one. <laughs> um, I had the, the kind of dubious um, uh, fortune to expose a major German forger, Wolfgang uh, Beltracchi, a few years ago, um, who made large sums of money out of this. And uh, earlier this year, I actually met him and was able to uh, um, talk to him about his methods. But in many ways, he showed, and I think forgers show, uh, um, there are the, the sort of larger patterns at work, and I know we're here focusing on one manuscript, but think from the forger's perspective, they're trying to make money out of their forgery, and they're likely to be playing a longer game than this one manuscript. There's another possibility, which is that this was to basically get a good line of work going, so it's cheap, get it accepted, get an easy sell, and then you can start building on it. So the thing to look for is, are there other things that came this route that are uh, larger, more costly, and way more devious? I've lost leader. Yes. <laughs> uh, so you have to see these things from a, this wider perspective. Do you mean, do you mean a, a forger like Ireland who, who starts something and then wants to keep going and going and going? They always do. Once you, I think once they start selling and making money, it's. Um, you, you just build up, build up, and you're, you're trying to set your credibility at first, so you would underpitch things, really, so that people get comfortable with you coming up with these wonderful finds. But this one is still on the price, I and mean, if the eight bidders was a price of 1805, then... No, no, it would it either be the price in... Uh, 1910 or 1910, because if it was 1805, you could have bought the first building, mm -hmm. eight bidders. Yeah, no, that it's but 20th century. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
when well, she was more used to laying out. She was more used to, she had the money, but she was more used to laying out shillings for books. Then in which case she's not a very good victim of the I think one, one thing that's worth bearing in mind is that after the First World War and into the twenties, there were a lot of fortunes working in Europe who were selling their stuff cheap. They just had to get money. Mm. Um, there are a whole mass of drawings done, supposed uh, 16th century Dutch drawings, which were going for ridiculously low amounts. Yeah. But it's just basically they got to eat. Yeah. The, the, the wonderful example of the Collier case shows that there are reasons other than financial remuneration. And I think that is one of the things that we have to consider. Well, I think that particularly with this one, um, it seems very much that the document was created for a purpose to um, sort of pre-antedate uh, the um, uh, romantic yachting you know, idea, etc. That is not something that an ordinary forger of just documents is going to think of. But what I was interested in was how decisive is the proof that the document has to look has to rely on the Sydney Lee piece of 1880. Alan McCall was convinced that it anticipated the insights that Sydney Lee would right. later. But I mean, is it is it uh, actual phrasing that? No, and there are deliberate mistakes so that it looks slightly different. Yeah. So whoever did this had to know a lot about ink. Had to know enough about watermarks to want them nowhere near this. I had to know a tremendous amount about Shakespeare studies. I had to know a lot about the psychology of the people he was trying to sell it to. There can't be that many people who fall under that set. Oh, you was dead. I wonder if I could ask a question of Nicholas Eastall and Peter Bauer in relation to Peter's remark about the burn that is created by iron gall ink. Um, Peter, is this, this is a slow burn or yeah. a quick burn? No, it's slow. Does that mean, therefore, if there isn't much evidence yet of burn, that this is a young um, imposition well, it, it, of ink onto paper? It, you, could, you couldn't say that categorically. Because, because many people made up their own ink or recipe. There are so many different ways of doing it. Some people's inks are much less likely to burn than others. Um, some inks are dreadful, you know, with literally bits of paper that fall apart and burn right through the sheet. Others are not, you know, nothing like that. So it's just, a, it's just something that struck me when I looked at it. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm a book conservator, and I, I'm an archive conservator, and I work with an awful lot of manuscripts. And this is purely subjective. What I'm seeing is if you have good quality paper, you don't get much um, volume degradation. Right? In good week, so you wouldn't get it. I think the vast quantity is a good quality paper, writing on good quality paper. There's no sign of any in being any. In, yeah, there, there are a lot of variables involved and, and storage conditions and all sorts of other things as well. So you, you have to factor in all those aspects before you can uh, truly understand. There was a question earlier that didn't get asked. I was wondering whether some study of the punctuation in the document could be revealing. That is a great question. And I do not have the answer to that. But uh, clearly, punctuation habits change over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could speak to early modern differences, yeah. but I couldn't speak to early 19th century practice. But that, too, is uh, a great, great way of trying to see if there are any uh, slips, so to speak. Um, have any study been done of the, uh, the idiolect of the manuscript against uh, Wilmot, um, that is, the types of words he used? Um, here? Well, there isn't really much of Wilmot surviving. Most of Wilmot, what we know about Wilmot is his nieces. 
fantasy biography. Um, That's the beauty of it. <laughs> <laughs> and in the manuscript itself, it's this man, James Corton Cowell, reporting Wilmot. <laughs> Could I add to that, that if Brian Vickers, were he here, and he's unable to be here tonight, of course, in his London Forum for Authorship and Attribution Studies, spends a very great deal of time looking at um, early modern um, vocabulary and <coughs> word use, and, and I expect punctuation. But he, he said to me today, when I um, rang to apologize that he couldn't be here, um, and I, um, I um, mentioned to him, that James Shapiro was going to do some data mining on some of the words in the document. He said, well, of course, if that document were electronically available and studied exactly the same kinds of techniques as he has been himself developing for early modern um, texts could be applied to this. Uh, and, um, and he thought that <coughs> was an important way forward. Um, again, recognizing that what's in the OED um, only takes one so far, and that data mining techniques uh, could be applied in, you know, in, a, in a fruitful way. Sorry, I just, I just um, went on to Ayn Graham, just because Which I could. Are... And uh, it, it, um, it flatlines until, sorry, my computer's gone to sleep, both have again. 1820 for very unromantic. Um, and for just romantic, so it's nothing until 1820, and for um, unromantic, there's a little little bit of squiggling going uh, in point <coughs> beneath point zero 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 eight percent of that's the entire little database. So uh, yeah. not a lot going on unromantically according to that. But it does raise the question of the relationship between manuscript vocabulary and printed vocabulary. Absolutely. And I, it's a complicated That's a huge story. question as well. Mm -hmm. And again, what you're seeing is um, somebody trained in the 1970s plucking out a single word that looks like it's an aberration, uh, and I'm describing myself, rather than a systematic analysis of punctuation, syntax, all kinds of linguistic habits. And I suspect there'll be a lot of dissertations done in the next 20 years as data mining becomes more, I hate the phrase, it sounds like we take the tops off of literary words and leave them like hills in Kentucky denuded. But um, uh, I, I do think that uh, it has a great deal of value, uh, and especially when we're dealing with questions of attribution. But I also think that um, we have to think like forgers and uh, think out of the box and resist the tendencies that we have because the people who create these forgeries assume that we're going to think in predictable ways. And in fact, seduce one of the great authorities, Albert Ice Nicole, into putting together this manuscript with the Sears biography without which this would never have taken hold. So we have to really think about the psychological uh, uh, aspects of this and the ways in which entrenched thinking, uh, as you both must know, dealing with forgeries. Forgeries um, look transparently like forgeries after they've been exposed, but until then, they look perfectly fine. It's, it's always the first one that's the problem. I know this is good. Uh, there's one, sorry, Cam, there is also one, one more question over here. Please. Was there a hand up? Oh, no, I had a question. Now, were you using capital letters or lowercase letters? I did lowercase. Low OK, because you might try uppercase, because n-grams are case sensitive. I do that. Right and actually, if you just type in unromantic plus unromantic, one of them capital, one not capital, you'll right, get them okay. both together. This oh, is mine should have been wearing their minor hat, so <laughs> that a minor is worth. <laughs> I wanted to ask for a vocabulary search Same on Ingram as well. Same result on that. <laughs> I wanted to ask a vocabulary question. Could you look up? Um, I am B E D E N. I am B E D E N. I am mother. 
B E D E N and try also I M B I D E N. It's just while we're looking at vocabulary, this was a handwriting that was basically extremely easy to read. But there was one word which I couldn't read. I asked so many people and nobody could do it. It's got lots of minims in it. I had a PDF, so I blew it up. I changed the colour of the, the background I, and I still can't do it. It looks to me like in, in bidden, or in, in bedden, probably. I-M-B-E-D-E-N. It's how Cowell, in inverted commas, is saying that he got his information, he says it's such a uh, something or other, in in bedden way, um, as in obviously secretive or devious or something like that, but the word looks like in bedden. I did a search on Echo and I couldn't find anything. I also did a search on Echo for everything I thought it could have been. Unbidden was possible but it just doesn't make sense. You did, you did have embed and sometimes felt in a variant form of in bed and that would be an idea of the secrecy but I thought but that I couldn't find any he evidence for he did it off his own back he did it unbidden it could be with, with that um, in which case it's misspelled because it's missing a D it doesn't look quite right but it's that's my second idea for it if it was in, in bed, then I couldn't find any justification for making it a strong verb. Just why, but I didn't have engram. It turns out zero. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's an anagram of the four dollars. We're happy to continue talking over alcohol. <laughs> we, do, we do have some drinks outside. Please, please join us. And, and, and the four do. Could we thank the speakers? I don't think I've ever been at a symposium that's gone on for two hours when nobody has left. Because <laughs> <laughs> the weather is terrible outside. <laughs> 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 Thank you.